proposition for discussion, the first two nights of this debate is, the use of mechanical instruments of music as an element of Christian worship is without scriptural authority and therefore sinful. Alan Hires affirms, Given Blakely denies. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful for the opportunity to appear before you this evening in defense of what I believe to be the truth of God and in the affirmation of the proposition which has been read in your hearing. In the outset, I wish to say that this is not a personal confrontation. I have never known Brother Blakely prior to this debate. I certainly have no ill will or animosity toward him. We are here because of our basic differences over what the scriptures teach. And this is what we shall be discussing during the course of this debate. I'm not here to make any personal attacks against Brother Blakely, and I trust that he shall make none against me. But I do expect to challenge his position forthrightly and without mercy. And of course, I anticipate that he will do the same in regard to the matters that I shall present. It is my responsibility to read and defend the proposition which we are to discuss on the first two evenings. The proposition is important because it states the issue between us. The proposition is the use of mechanical instruments of music as an element of Christian worship is without scriptural authority and therefore sinful. By the use, I mean the employment or the utilization. By mechanical instruments of music, I mean musical instruments such as the piano or the organ, which are humanly devised and crafted. By element, I mean component or constituent parts. By Christian worship, I mean acts of reverence or homage paid to God by Christians under the New Testament dispensation. By without scriptural authority, I mean that such use is not authorized, sanctioned, or taught by the Word of God. By therefore sinful, I mean that as a consequence of its use without divine approbation, it is an act of lawlessness as contemplated by 1 John 3, 4, and is therefore displeasing to God. At this point, I want to emphasize in particular one brief but highly significant word in the proposition. I am speaking of the predicate verb is. Please note that I am not speaking of what was or even what shall be. But this is a discussion of New Testament authority for this dispensation in which we live. I believe that this will adequately set forth the issue before you. Basically, I am contending that there is no scriptural authority for employing instruments of music as a part of our worship today. And Brother Blakely is denying that proposition. You may have observed that I am required by the proposition to affirm a negative. That is not ordinarily desirable in debate. But in this case, it is Brother Blakely's practice that is on trial. Therefore, I am placed in the position of arguing that his position is not authorized. But the interesting thing about this state of affairs is that Brother Blakely can end this debate this evening simply by pointing to the passage of Scripture which shows that instrumental music is authorized as an element or constituent part of Christian worship. Now, if he fails to do so, it seems to me that this audience should begin to wonder whether such a passage exists. We shall wait with great anticipation to see whether Brother Blakely will cite such a passage. 
Now, before I proceed with my affirmative presentation, I have some questions which I want to present to Brother Blakely and which I trust he will answer when he comes before us. Number one, please indicate whether each of the following statements is true or false. A, worship must be offered to God as authorized by divine truth. True or false? B, worship may be rendered to God according to that which one devises and prescribes for himself. True or false? C, it is possible for there to exist in our day such a thing as vain worship. True or false? Two, are there any restrictions on what a New Testament Christian may offer as worship to God? If so, please state what they are and how they may be determined. Three, which of the following practices, if any, would you oppose if offered by Christians as worship to God? A, burning incense. B, using rosary beads. C, religious dancing. B, handling snakes as a token of worship. E, using meat and potatoes on the Lord's table. Four, if you would oppose any of the foregoing items, please state on what scriptural basis you would do so. And five, are New Testament Christians engaging in worship in observing the Lord's Supper? And is it a scriptural requirement for them to do each Lord's Day? Now, this time I would like to call your attention to the chart which is entitled, The Authority of Christ. And I insist that this is what we are really debating here tonight. We are not simply debating whether it is right or wrong to sing with a mechanical instrument and praise to God. What is really at stake here is whether we respect and abide within the authority of Christ. And I believe that will become more apparent as we proceed in this debate. Now on this chart, we have set forth a number of passages indicating the importance of the authority of Christ. I call your attention in the beginning to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, in which it is said, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Please observe that whatsoever we do in word or deed, in doctrine or in practice, we are to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. To do a thing in the name of a person is to act by his authority. The law officer says, open up in the name of the law, that is, by the authority of the law. Thayer, one of the greatest of the Greek English lexicographers, says in defining name, by a usage chiefly Hebraistic, the name is used for everything which the name covers. And he further states it means to do a thing by one's command and authority, acting on his behalf, promoting his cause. Now that is precisely what we are contending for with reference to Colossians 3 and verse 17. That to act in the name of Christ means that we are to act in accordance with his divine authority. The same idea is found in Acts 4 and verse 7, where Peter and John were asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Amen. Consequently, when we are admonished to do all in the name of the Lord, this simply establishes that we are to operate within the sphere of divine authority. Then further in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul admonishes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. The American Standard Version says that in us you might learn not to go beyond the things which are written. 
that which is written is phraseology known to all of us to refer to those things which God has revealed in the scriptures. Matthew 4, verses 4, 7, and 10. The point here is that one may not factionalize the church. For to do such is to go above or beyond the authority of the scriptures. Now here is a significant question. If one cannot organize a personal sect because there is no scriptural authority for such, how could one conclude that he could introduce elements of worship for which there is no scriptural authority? If one may go beyond the things which are written in the addition of instrumental music to the worship, then what other elements could he add also without scriptural authority? This admonition from the Apostle Paul either means what it says or it means nothing at all. I insist it means what it says. Further, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Paul says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Further, in Hebrews 11, 6, Without faith it is impossible to please him. Christianity is a system of faith. And our worship to God must be offered in faith in order to please him. Where there is no word, there can be no faith. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. Watch it now. No word, no faith. No faith, no walking by faith. No walking by faith, no pleasing God. Now that is simple, but it is biblical. And Brother Blakely is going to have to deal with these principles in this discussion. Then in 2 John 9, it is said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Doctrine is not to be treated frivolously. Paul said to Timothy, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16. He instructed Titus, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Titus 2 and verse 1. Now I have this question. Does doctrine affect worship? This is an important question, and I hope that Brother Blakely will address himself to it. Jesus dealt with the matter in Matthew 15 and verse 9 when he said, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Our Lord left no doubt that doctrine does affect worship. We will be anxious to see what Brother Blakely says about it and whether he agrees with what Jesus said. And then as a further indication of the importance of truth as it relates to worship, take note of our Lord's instructions with reference to worship in John 4 and verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Three things are set forth about worship. First, the right object, God. Second, the right manner in spirit. Third, the right standard in truth. For purposes of this discussion, I especially want to emphasize the divine standard imposed for worship and imposed by none other than Christ himself. It is to be offered in truth. In John 17, 17, in his prayer to the Father, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Not all worship is acceptable worship. The right act performed in the wrong spirit is wrong. And the wrong act performed in the right spirit is wrong. But Jesus has told us what is right and what is acceptable to him. Worship God in spirit and in truth. And that is precisely what we are contending for in this debate. But now how are these principles to be applied to the question of instrumental music as an element of Christian worship? pointed out on the chart that instrumental music simply does not correspond to these passages which we have introduced relating to the authority of Christ. Instrumental music, number one, is not commanded. I do not believe that Brother Blakely will dispute that. If he does, I'll be anxious to see what he says. Number two, instrumental music is not by faith. And remember that we have emphasized without faith it is impossible to please God. 
and that where there is no word, there can be no faith. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If there is no word on instrumental music, there can be no faith. It cannot be done by faith, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Furthermore, we have emphasized from Colossians 3 and verse 17 that all is to be done in the name of Jesus Christ. And we have shown how that that signifies the necessity of his divine authority. And yet we further insist that instrumental music is not in the name of Christ because it is not by his authority. Furthermore, it is not in the doctrine of Christ. And whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. If it is a part of the doctrine of Christ, then Brother Blakely, of course, is obliged to show us that it is. If he cannot show us that it is a part of the doctrine of Christ, then he's obliged to explain to us how that it is acceptable not being a part of the doctrine of Christ. And then furthermore, it is not in truth. Theme that worship is to be in spirit and in truth, and the truth is a reference to God's objective standard. It is a reference to God's word. Thy word is truth. And we have asked the question of Brother Blakely whether that worship is affected by doctrine. And we anticipate that he will give us an answer along that line, and that he will deal with Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. Now then, if it is not in truth, then how can we worship in spirit and in truth by abandoning the truth or by forsaking the truth or by not doing that which is within the truth? And incidentally, along that line, I have an excerpt here from the commentary on John published by College Press and written by Brother Paul T. Butler. Now this is published by those who are on Brother Blakely's side of this particular issue. And yet I notice with a great deal of satisfaction what Brother Butler has to say on this subject in John 4 and verse 24. He says, what does Jesus mean by worshiping in spirit and in truth? He goes on to say, thus to worship in spirit and truth is A, to make it a matter of the heart, the will, the spirit, and the emotion, and not merely a matter of physical atmosphere, and B, to worship in accordance with the revealed will of God in the New Testament. And I believe that Brother Butler is exactly right. And I wait to see what disposition Brother Blakely will make in regard to this same matter. And further in this commentary, he says, any worship which is contrary to what is revealed in the New Testament is divisive and disobedient. That's important. And then furthermore, we have demonstrated that instrumental music is not by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, if it comes by hearing, let us have the book, chapter, and verse from the word of God. In the next place, we insist that it is not apostolic. If so, tell us where the apostles ever taught it. Furthermore, it is not practiced in the New Testament, and there is not one word to suggest that it was. And if Brother Blakely feels that he is able to present a verse that shows that it was, we certainly invite his diligence to that task. Then it is not mentioned in New Testament worship. Now here's something that I've noticed in discussing this matter with a number of those who contend for the use of the instruments. They talk about how that instrumental music is mentioned. And they're up 
often they will say that it is mentioned favorably. Well, I want to show tonight that it is not merely a matter of whether it is mentioned. Nor is it a matter of whether it is mentioned favorably. It is a matter of whether it is mentioned favorably in New Testament worship. And if our brother who is on the other side of this issue is not able to show and to demonstrate that, then I insist in the very first speech of this debate that he will have failed, utterly failed, to carry the issue for which he is contending. And we're anxious to see what he will do along that line. Then finally I have said that it is not authorized. And we began tonight talking in this chart about the authority of Jesus Christ. And I have said that is the real issue that we shall be debating. Not merely instrumental music, which I believe is symptomatic of the issue, but the issue of the authority of Jesus Christ. And I predict, I predict that we are going to hear some rather startling, and I believe some rather far-fetched statements and declarations from Brother Blakely on this matter of the authority of Christ. And I urge you to be alert and to have a keen ear in regard to that, and as he brings those matters forth, we shall deal with them one by one. In light of all of these characteristics, we do not hesitate to say that the use of instrumental music is without scriptural authority and therefore sinful, and that it constitutes strange worship in the same sense that Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire upon the altar in Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2. It is strange in that it is unauthorized and unacceptable. The Hebrew writer warned, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Hebrews 13 and verse 9. Now I would like to call for chart number one on the transparency. And to give you a brief overview of the matters presented based upon divine authority. Notice that on this chart number one, the basic argument against instrumental music. Number one, all acts or activities employed in Christian worship as acts or actions of worship without scriptural authority are acts or actions which are sinful. That is what we've endeavored to show by the passages that we have introduced tonight. Then in the second place, the use of mechanical instruments of music in Christian worship is an act or action without scriptural authority. And thus the conclusion, therefore, the use of mechanical instruments of music in Christian worship is an act or action which is sinful. Now, this argument is valid. And if the premises are true, the conclusion must follow. We have set forth in this first address the proof for both the major and the minor premises. And therefore, to overthrow the argument, Brother Blakely must demonstrate that one or both of these premises is false. And this we do not believe he shall be able to do, nor shall it be done till this old world is on fire. Thank you. Brother Deppenbaugh and the elders at the Hillcrest Church of Christ. <clears throat> this is an occasion <clears throat> in which we have been summoned into the arena of godly thought. And while I am impressed with the credentials of Brother Hires and commend him for his achievement in the legal profession, they are of no value at all in the kingdom of God. 
We are here to evaluate God and his people and God's acceptance of his people. I want to come to grips at first with this proposition that Brother Hires has presented to us. I do not assume it's propriety. I do not agree that it's properly stated. I do not concur with the nomenclature that has been employed. It is neither apostolic nor godly. I would like to call for chart one. As we begin our discussion, we cannot assume the correctness of the proposition. The use of mechanical instruments of music as an element of Christian worship is without scriptural authority and therefore sinful. I'm glad that our Brother Hires mentioned it was a negative proposition that is an intriguing thought. It seems to be a contradiction of reason to affirm a negative. For a person, as uh, all of us here, I would assume, individuals that have been exposed to the apostolic mind and to the statements of our Lord Jesus Christ, as they spoke, they spoke with a great body of reality that supported their statements. They had something to say. I suggest to you that this proposition has in fact nothing to say, that there is no body of reality that supports it, that after the heavens and the earth have passed away and there is no more sea, that there will be nothing to support this proposition. And this is its chief weakness, therefore it will be supported by man's wisdom. Now concerning the questions that you set before me, it is possible to ask the wrong question. And in my heart, I must be honest, I believe these are the wrong questions, that they do not address reality. And as I address this proposition, you shall see my reasoning on this issue. Now what does our proposition offer us? It offers us no ultimate spiritual reality to support it. And while he has charged that my proposition, which I will affirm, offers nothing for faith to grasp. There is nothing that his proposition offers for faith to grasp. No reality that supports it. Chart two, please. Now I want to come to grip with what I uh, disagree with in this proposition. The words that are underlined are key words in the proposition, but they are invalid words. They are uninspired words. They are ungodly words. They, are, they involve the superimposition of man's wisdom upon the word of God, mechanical instruments of music. God in his word has spoken of musical instruments and instruments of music. He has never spoken of mechanical instruments. My mind is molded by God's articulations, not man. An element of Christian worship. What, pray tell, is an element of Christian worship? And where does the notion come that worship has elements? Where is that presented in the Word of God? An element of Christian worship. The word Christian is not used in this manner by the apostles that spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit employed the word Christian, he nowhere used it after this manner. So I am sorry, but I cannot accept this use of a Holy Spirit-inspired term without scriptural authority. Without scriptural authority presents the possibility that the word of God is, after all, a manual of liturgical conduct, which I emphatically deny that it is. The word of God represents mankind as receiving authority upon the basis of Christ to come to God. It does not represent worship as being upon the basis of authority. <clears throat> An element of Christian worship postulates a network of predetermined acts. And before I accept that sort of language, we must have the scripture that presents to us this interrelated network of acts that have been pre-approved pre by our God. After the apostles gave a number of directives in scripture, almost all of their directives had to do with moral failure and moral misconduct, and in no case did they give directives for corporate worship. If I might have chart 80, verse 88. 
If I understand the word mechanical properly, turned over. Mechanical means is something that is means seemingly uninfluenced by the mind or emotion. I question that there is such a thing as a mechanical instrument. Just because a person chooses to say there is and assigns their own definition to it, I don't accept that definition. I will grovel in the dust before my God. I will not bow before the definitions of man and self-made nomenclatures. This is a not a valid concept at all. If I might have chart 28, please. An element of Christian worship. I am questioning the validity of this proposition. Precisely where has God authorized any element of worship in any place or at any time? And a single reference will suffice for that. You see, in the Word of God, no believer was ever arraigned for worshiping wrongly. Chart 21, please. <clears throat> we have good reason to believe, men and brethren, <clears throat> that meticulous requirements are for disobedient and gain same people. No believer was ever arraigned by the apostles for worshiping incorrectly. If they were, of course, uh, we need to have a reference on that. <clears throat> because something is not supposedly authorized by scripture, foreign language, strange nomenclature, you can't get this out of the word of God. God doesn't speak this way. Man speaks this way. And while it may appear to the unlearned as though I'm evading the subject, I am not. I'm simply refusing to accept the parameters that he has set forth here tonight. I refuse to accept the validity of this proposition. It is an erroneous one. There are a number of incidents in Scripture where people are said to have worshipped our Lord Jesus Christ, who was the express image of God. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Jesus Christ bodily. He was the ambulatory temple of the living God, and his attitude toward worship adequately portrays to us God's attitude toward it. On one occasion, a woman come into our Lord, and without any authority whatsoever, without any scriptural precedent whatsoever, broke an alabaster box of ointment and poured it upon our Lord in honor and devotion to him. And while his disciples uh, raised their ire because of this, he said, let her alone. She hath done a good deed. Wherever the gospel is preached, this will be, be, may be made mention of her. No authorization whatsoever. No precedent whatsoever. In fact, you are hard-pressed to find any place in Scripture where anyone worshipped acceptably the Lord Jesus Christ, where anyone bowed the knee, said anything, requested anything, wherever they worshipped, that they did so by an authorized act and by a prescribed manner. If such a thing is in there, we would do well to have it given to us. Now, someone might say, well, alas, this throws the door open for all sorts of violations. But the apostles safeguarded the gospel as they saw fit. When they ministered the word of God, they did not minister it with their immediate generation. In mind, they spoke it, uh, anchoring truth for all time in the earth. And they did not see fit to safeguard the truth by the statement of this uh, sort. You need an authorization of scripture to worship God. I question that. I question that there is such a thing as authorized worship. Jesus did not permit the Pharisees to define sin by their tradition, and I cannot conceive of him permitting you to do so. This is nothing more than a, an attempt at creed making. Now, what do we have in this proposition? We have the development of a unique and uninspired vocabulary, a mode of reasoning that is strange to those subjected to the Word of God. 
and it is wedged into the word of God, this strange nomenclature. But I profess that it is wood, hay, and stubble that it cannot stand the fire of divine judgment. There are dramatic differences between us, I suggest to you. I suggest that our concept of the scriptures is not at all the same. I do not permit you to take the part of the scripture that you say is the New Testament and to arbitrarily cut it away from all the rest of God's word and say that this segment and this segment alone is where we obtain our authority. Worship, your concept is a traditional view, not a godly view. Worship is not so addressed in the word of God, nor is your methodology of identifying right and wrong. You see, the issue has erupted between us because we have not seen God alike. Now, there are some underlying assumptions that undergird this proposition. First of all, that God teaches primary truth without stating it. And that a mechanical instrument distinguishes properly from vocal music or from singing with the heart. We have assumed that there is such a thing as corporate worship. I am questioning that. We are assuming that an assembly in an assembly, sinfulness comes from not doing things right. I am questioning that. Well, I am questioning the, the authenticity of the term Christian worship. The proposition has resulted from arbitrary meanings that have not been employed by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, I want to make sure that I understand what has been said here tonight. As I understand that Brother Hires is speaking for God Almighty, that he is God's representative in this matter, that God is speaking through him to us and is saying to us that he is not pleased with instrumental music in his service. That he is going to judge men by the word stated in this proposition. That the Spirit of God is upon Brother Harris tonight and that he is informing us of the rejection of this sort of worship that he has specified. That it's not honored in heaven, that it voids worship upon earth, that it invalidates the sincere heart and negates the person's profession of faith. And if this is not the case, there is, of course, no point to the proposition at all. I suggest that the proposition has been built upon sand. It is possible to have superior arguments to support faulty premises. Our Lord spoke of a house that was built upon a foundation that was not solid. The house, no doubt, was built of good materials, but it was built upon a faulty foundation. And when the winds uh, and the rains came and the floods beat upon the house, it fell, not because it wasn't constructed properly, but because it was on a foundation of sand. I suggest to you that we are going to bring the fires and the winds of God's word against this syllogistic house that has been stated in this proposition. I intend to prove to you that the proposition itself is faulty and that if worship is sub uh, presented as not being regulated that the proposition falls to the ground completely the burden of brother hires proof is to substantiate that there is such a thing as regulated worship that worship can in fact be regulated and is so presented in the word of god chart 110 please I see your task as a Herculean one, one that requires an unusual effort. Your effort is to substantiate that the basis for your reasoning is correct. You must establish the following, chart 111. You must establish that there is such a thing as corporate worship. You must substantiate that with the word of God. That corporate worship is just as possible as corporate salvation or corporate damnation or corporate love. I am persuaded there is no such thing as corporate worship. That wherever there's a sincere heart among insincere people, that person is received of God. I have some even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. And if there is an uh, insincere person among sincere people, he is not received because his heart's not right to God. I question the validity of corporate worship. <clears throat> Chart 63, please. There is an underlying concept here that is not valid 
in Christ Jesus. Precision and detail are not consistently provided by the apostles. The have I done it right syndrome is out of harmony with the nature of the new covenant. <clears throat> and that is, after all, the whole issue in this proposition is have we worshipped God right? Have we worshipped God correctly? Have we done the right thing? I am questioning that concept. I am saying that must be undergirded. That must be substantiated. It must be proved that the concept is valid in the first place. The have I done it right concept. It's borrowed from the moonlight period of the law and is owing more to law than to grace. I'd say that this sort of rule contradicts our reconciliation to God. That the very thought that God Almighty could reconcile us to himself by Christ Jesus and then hold us an arm away telling us we worship in certain ways and prescribed manners is a flagrant contradiction of what Jesus Christ has done when he died to take away the sins of the world and open the door of heaven so we could draw near with a true heart. And in uh, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Those, uh, those requirements are quite different from a routine. How much time do I have? I suggest to you that worship of God cannot be fulfilled by a routine, and the fear of God cannot be taught by the precept of men. <clears throat> Chart 16, please. Brother Harris has frequently used this term. I expect him to use it more throughout our discussion, New Testament worship. It's a strange word. You can look in your concordance from now till the heavens pass away with a great noise. You'll never find it in there. It's not a Holy Spirit word. It's man's word. It's an attempt to codify something God has not codified. <clears throat> worship is not divine. If worship is not divinely regulated, your entire proposition falls to the ground. And I suggest to you that you must go to work and prove that worship, divine worship, is regulated by God. Did you uh, not remember the wise men that came and worshipped Christ? They brought unto him unauthorized gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They weren't told to do it, they did it. The leper who came to Jesus and made an unauthorized request, if thou wilt, says he worshipped him, making this request, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. A certain ruler came to Jesus and with an unauthorized request said, My daughter is now dead. Come and lay thy hand upon her. Unauthorized. Yet the Holy Spirit said he worshipped Jesus when he did it. The unauthorized woman of Canaan, an unauthorized person with an unauthorized request, Lord, help me. She went away that day having worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ in whom dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Chart 17. <clears throat> Before we can adequately deal with this issue, we must uh, know the answer to this question. Precisely, uh, what is worship? How are you using the term? Is it a network of acts that God has described and stamped as valid before him? Is this what worship is? Is this what the Holy Spirit describes? Or has the Holy Spirit defined it at all? Or is it spelled out at all? We read about elements of faith. We read about what faith is. We read about what hope is. We read about what love is. Where do we read what worship is? Chart 18, please. <clears throat> Provide us with a single reference where those in Christ Jesus are instructed on how to worship or where a group of believers worship. If no references can be provided, how can you be so sure of what is authorized? How can you? Can a person in Christ Jesus worship wrongly? Now we have set before us a classic incongruity. God proclaims in Christ Jesus that he has reconciled us to himself, yet we are being faced here tonight with a theology that holds man at arm's length, that sets up fences and boundaries beyond which we cannot come. I am amazed that such a religion could be proclaimed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has ascended up far above all things that he might 
fill all things. That even though we're reconciled to God, still we're under rules like those who were not reconciled to God. Even though we are freed from the law, having died to it in Christ Jesus, that in the heavenlies we're still under law, though not lawless. Though our sins have been purged, yet we can come no nearer to God than those whose sins were not purged. I'm stating that the concept of regulated worship contradicts reconciliation. That sin has been taken out of the way. The middle wall of partition has been taken down. The way to God has been opened up. The prison doors have been opened and the prison is declared free. Salvation cannot possibly include regulated worship. That's one of the things we were saved from. The whole uh, presentation tonight reminds me of an account of some men that were wandering out in the desert. Uh, they were discouraged having spent a considerable amount of their time without direction. When they happened upon a set of footprints, <coughs> they, uh, they noticed they were human footprints and with a feeling of exhilaration said we must not be far from hope and far from home. Uh, finally they arrived at the crest of a dune where the prints had become solidified. They knelt down to carefully examine the footprints. Finally the leader rose to his feet with a gasp. He said they they are our own footprints. I suggest to you that this fine network of theology represents man's own footprint, that your own reasoning has brought you to these conclusions, not the reasoning of God Almighty. Thank you. Obviously, I've made a serious mistake. I thought I was coming to a debate. <laughs> Brother Blakely has not said one word about one argument that I presented. He has not dealt with one passage of Scripture that I have introduced. He has not discharged the responsibility that is incumbent upon him as a negative speaker in the debate. It is the duty of the affirmative speaker to present a case for the proposition. It is then the duty of the negative speaker to analyze and evaluate the proofs presented by the affirmative. And there is not anyone present here tonight in this audience, no matter what his conviction on the subject may be, who has any idea whatsoever that Brother Blakely has addressed the arguments that have been presented. Now apparently he had in mind that what we had here tonight was a lecture series. But I was going to deliver a lecture, and then he would be given the opportunity also to deliver a lecture. And I could not help but be amused at the manner in which he approached the subject, which obviously he had prepared entirely in advance, and in which he talked about various things that I was obligated to do, and paid no attention whatsoever to the fact that I had done those things. And so he's given me very little to do as I go back through his speech because he has not endeavored to address the proposition at all. And I set out in the very first affirmative address that I delivered that if he has scriptural authority for his practice, I believe that he is under obligation to give it. And I said at the very outset that if he does not give it, and if he does not cite the passage of scripture that authorizes what he does, I believe this audience is going to begin to take notice. 
we certainly may say that for the time being, he simply has not done it. Now, he began tonight by saying that he disagreed with the nomenclature of my proposition. And he further stated that there is nothing to support the proposition. Well, are we required simply to take his ipsy dixit, his say so in the matter? What has he said tonight about the elaborate discussion that I gave of Colossians 3 and verse 17? Whereby we are admonished to do all in the name of the Lord. And I have shown precisely what is signified by in the name. Now, he comes along and says we do not have to have divine authority. Did I not tell you that would be the discussion? And did I not warn you very early in this debate to be very alert to what he would say along that line? I have to say this, I congratulate Brother Blakely on one thing. He has helped some of my brethren. Because some of my brethren had the idea that there just was not any difference between the Christian churches and the churches of Christ save instrumental music. And they had been led to believe that was the case. And that if we could just satisfy the difficulty in regard to instrumental music, then there might be some hope of some unity. But Brother Berkeley has certainly jerked the rug out from under that contention tonight. Because he not only has not established instrumental music, but he has told us irrefutably, irrefragably, from his point of view, no authority is even needed. Now, he has done us a favor in setting out that they have an anti-authority stance regarding worship and toward the Word of God. And then you remember that I presented to him five questions. Would anyone here like to tell me what he said in answer to those questions? No, he didn't say they were irrelevant. What he said was they were the wrong questions. I suppose that I should have let Brother Blakely write my questions. And not only that, but he said they do not address reality. Brother Blakely, if you think the questions don't address reality, you ought to try to answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reality to the answers at all because there were not any answers. a man who is in the negative signed his name to a proposition supposedly agreed that he would negate what was affirmed and has not dealt with a single passage of scripture a single argument or a single question and then he said the words of the proposition were unscriptural and ungodly spoke out about a number of the expressions that are found in the proposition. For example, he had a chart here on mechanical instruments of music, and he objected to that very strenuously. But I defined in the very beginning what I meant by mechanical instruments of music for purposes of this proposition. I stated that I simply referred to those that are mechanically devised or humanly crafted, such as the piano or the organ. What did he say about my definition? Not a word. And not only that, but if I were to take the word mechanical out of the proposition altogether and just say the employment of instruments of music, it wouldn't help him because he couldn't find it with the mechanical and he couldn't find it without the mechanical. 
So I don't understand what he uh, thinks that he has gained by objecting to the expression that is found in the proposition. He could not find it either way. And then he objected to the expression Christian worship. Let's have chart number 21. Now this is one of those expressions that he's referred to as not only unscriptural but ungodly. And I think that is right interesting because in this column I have the statements that have been made about worship by Brother Given Blakely. Why he has said the concept of worship is not articulated in Scripture, worship is never associated with a fixed interval of time or a set of required circum uh, circumstances. The worship of God is nowhere defined in Scripture. The majority of actions were unauthorized. Not one time is the matter of the worship of God approached with acceptable or authorized actions in mind. It is never presented as corporate commandment. The worship of God is never associated with act, form, or liturgy. But on the other side of the same chart, we have the writings of his father who is in the audience tonight and the editor of the Banner of Truth, Brother Fred O. Blakely. And Brother Fred says, public worship, he refers to it as the weekly worship, the Lord's Day worship, the assembly for worship, the worship assembly, the worship, worship service, in the worship, the Lord's Day worship service, and lo and behold, the exercise of Christian worship. Well, there he is using that unscriptural and ungodly terminology that Brother Gibbon complained about tonight. And he talks about the group worship. Do you remember Brother Blakely saying tonight, putting his chart up here, that there's no such thing as corporate worship? What about group worship? Now, Brother Fred, I think you're right. And would you take Brother Gibbon aside tonight and work on him? <laughs> Brother Fred says the time for the ordinance is at the assembly on the Lord's day. The frequency is weekly, talking about the Lord's Supper. Those who accept the scriptures as authoritative. What? Those who accept the scriptures as authoritative are virtually shut up to this conclusion. It becomes obligatory upon all who respect the authority of his word. If scripture binds the weekly observance of the communion upon all who would worship God in spirit and in truth, and he cites John 4, verses 21 to 24. Could not help but be reminded of the statement of our Lord, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. <laughs> Also a chart over here called Worship Defined. Brother Blakely has said that worship is never defined. And not only that, but he has challenged us tonight to show the meaning of the word worship very well. In the footnote in the American Standard Version on Matthew 2 and verse 2, with reference to the Greek word that is used in the original text, it is said an act of reverence, precisely the manner in which I defined it in my first affirmative speech about which he said not one single solitary word. Furthermore, given old Blakely says, worship can also be used of individual acts, acts, man, you, of homage. He told us a little while ago that it was not only unscriptural but ungodly to talk about acts of worship. But Brother Blakely himself has said worship can also be used of individual acts of homage. Then furthermore, John 4 and verse 24 has been referred to again by Brother Fred O. Blakely in these words, and I'm quoting exactly that comprehensive definition of Christian worship. 
And Brother Gibbon Blakely says, worship is not defined. Christian worship is a terminology that is unscriptural and ungodly. Brother Fred Blakely refers to John 4, 24 as that comprehensive definition of Christian worship. I pointed out that we have the object God, we have the manner in spirit, we have the standard in truth. And what is involved in that? In spirit means with the inward man. In truth means must be directed by and according to the truth. Vain worship is teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 15 and verse 9. Do you remember in my first speech that I asked him, and I thought very politely, does doctrine affect worship? And I said, Brother Blakely, I hope that you will notice that. He didn't do so, politely or otherwise. He did not say anything about the verse involved there, Matthew 15 and verse 9. I say acceptable worship is inseparable from teaching and obeying the truth. That's what this is all about. I want you to think about this, friends. Would he argue that no authority is even needed for what we do if he had the authority in his pocket? Obviously not. And therefore, I think it ought to be plain to every one of us that the manner of argumentation that is being pursued by Brother Blakely is in itself an acknowledgment he does not have it for his practice. And that's why he says, you don't need it. Then he says he questions that there's any need of authority. Let me see uh, chart number 22. And I want to show you that this is not what his brethren have always said at all. Here are some of the propositions that Christian church preachers have advocated in debate. J. Carroll Stark in his debate with Joe S. Warwick said, The Word of God authorizes the use of instrumental music for praise in the church of Jesus Christ. Homer A. Strong, in debate with Foley Wallace, Jr., and the Strongs, by the way, were the founders of Ozark Christian College. Instrumental music in worship is from God, and the Bible furnishes proof for its use in the New Testament church. M.D. Club, in his debate with H. Leo Bowles, said instrumental music in Christian worship is scriptural. Ira M. Boswell, in debate with N.D. Hardiman, said instrumental music in church worship is scriptural. Morris Butler, book and debate with James T. Miller, said the scriptures are sufficiently clear for Christians of normal intelligence to determine that devoted and talented use of certain mechanical instruments of music for praise and worship services is both permitted and required by the Word of God. Now, that's one of his preachers. He affirmed this about Christian worship. And here is Dwayne Dunning in his debate with Rubel Shelley, affirmed the New Testament authorizes the use of mechanical mechanical instruments of music in worship to God. Dwayne Dunning said three things that Given Blakely has said are unscriptural and ungodly. Number one, he says the New Testament authorizes. Number two, he speaks about mechanical instruments. And number three, he says they're in worship to God. Now what he's saying here tonight is utterly a departure from what his brethren have said in the past. It is a repudiation of them. And I believe that it is an acknowledgment that he realizes they have been unable to defend their practice, and thus he has established an entirely new hermeneutic tonight, which says, in effect, we do not have authority, we do not need authority, we will not give authority. And then he referred to the fact that he does not believe there is any such thing as regulated worship in the New Testament. Well, Brother Blakely, if it were there, I'm inclined to think you wouldn't pay any attention to it. Judging by the manner in which you paid attention to the passages that I presented tonight, you're right where you were before you made your first speech. 
You have not yet started on the first affirmative address that has been delivered in this debate. He said, you must prove that worship is regulated. We have shown that it is in spirit and in truth, and in truth means must be directed by and according to the truth. That's what is involved in a regulation. That is what is involved in saying that worship must be in truth. And so that's the very thing that we have established. But he simply has paid no attention to it. He has not said anything at all about it. Now let me have chart number four. You will see why it is that he ignored the questions and said that they were the wrong questions. They're the wrong questions, all right, for his proposition and for his position. Here are some of the same ideas. Worship and authority. Given Blakely said worship is never associated with a fixed interval of time or a set of required circumstances. The worship of God is nowhere defined in Scripture. Well, the Fred says it is. The majority of actions associated with worship were unauthorized. Not one time is a matter of the worship of God approached with acceptable or authorized actions in mind. Therefore, we may, now please tell us, burn incense and worship to God, observe the Lord's Supper on Monday, use tea and meat in the communion, employ rosary beads as an aid to prayer, do a holy dance before the Lord, handle snakes as a token of worship. Let him tell us this. The reason he said that these were the wrong questions is because these are the right questions. If a man is going to say you do not have to have authority for what you do in worship, if a man is going to argue as his main premise that worship does not have to be regulated, if a man is going to say you do not have to have any direction from the Word of God as to what you do in worship, pray tell me how he is going to exclude any one of these. And that's why that I asked him not only to tell us what he could do, but also the basis on which he arrives at that conclusion. Now, we hope he'll do better in his next address. <clears throat> I appreciate your oratory for the hires. I really do. But you still must come to grips with the proposition that you've set before us. Your arguments are based upon the validity of that proposition. The whole of your argument stands or falls upon whether or not worship can be regulated. You have not given to us any word from God that teaches that it can be regulated. You have stated to us Colossians, the third chapter in verse 17, Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You have provided for us the comment of Brother Thayer to interpret what it means to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to expound that verse, what it actually does mean. We have been baptized into Christ, into the name of Christ. The name of Christ stands for his person, for his character. When the Heavenly Father proclaimed his name to Moses in the Holy Mount, he unveiled his character. The name of Christ, the name of God is their person and their character into which we have been baptized by the grace of God. Everything that we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be done out of that spiritual relationship and union with Christ. To put it another way, we are never authorized to borrow a term to act out of character. Everything we do, whether word or deed, note it does not say worship, word or deed, everything is to be done out of this spiritual union with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, or to put it another way, being filled with the Holy Spirit, where man being joined to God becomes one spirit with him, the word of God being written upon their hearts and upon their minds, they do things because they see and understand the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Life is the point of Colossians, the third chapter, not legality. That's confirmed by the following statement, giving thanks, to God the Father by him is not giving thanks because he told us the rules, is not being thanks because he told us how to do it, is giving thanks because we perceive somewhat of a magnitude of his redemption that's in Christ Jesus. I suggest that such an attitude cannot be achieved by law. You cannot command a person to give thanks. You cannot command an activity of the heart. It is the illuminating of the heart that produces this valid sort of obedience. One person has translated that text, your words and deeds are to begin and to end with Christ. 
The question is whether authority is the basis of the new covenant or participation. I maintain that participation is the basis of the new covenant. That the reason why we don't burn incense and offer animal sacrifices is because they do not blend with the reality that's been proclaimed by the gospel. It's because they don't comport with where we are in Christ Jesus. Unlike the old covenant in which people did not participate but were alienated from God in their understanding, the disobedient and again saying people, sin, the separating element, has been removed by Christ Jesus. We have been joined to the Lord and now we participate in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Anything incompatible with that realm is unlawful for the people of God. Not because God failed out our particular approach to him he has not you will notice that with care and deliberation brother hires has not told us where god regulated our worship i'm questioning that worship can at all be regulated if worship is an expression of the heart of an insightful heart one that has seen the heights and depths and breadth and length of the gospel of christ i am saying that in the presence of god it is impossible not to worship that it is impossible to be aware of and cognizant of God through Christ Jesus as proclaimed in the gospel and not worship before him. The gospel writer puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 14. It's the love of Christ that constraineth us because we thus judge, not we thus take rules and decipher how we ought to approach God. We thus judge in a sound mind how to approach unto God. Now I suggest unto you the text in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, gives us the proper approach to God and comes the closest to what we have heard called a corporate worship. There we are told to us to come by a new and a living way which Christ has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. That having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled of an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. All of these approaches that he mentions in the assembly, none of them are routine or liturgies. They are a cognizance of a high priest over the house of God. They are a full assurance of faith in the heart. They are having the heart sprinkled of an evil conscience before God and having our bodies washed with the pure baptismal waters. Now I suggest to you, is that inadequate as we come before God? Can you improve on that? Can a person come before God with these qualities and be turned away? Or is there some unknown liturgy that takes the precedence over this approach to the living God. Jesus Christ said to his disciples, and well it ought to be expounded to us all, he said, after you have done all that you've been commanded, you say we are unprofitable servants, we have done only that which it was our duty to do, and yet Brother Hires has presented to us a theology and approach to God, if you please, that limits us to doing what we've been commanded to do, and the word of the king says that after we have done all that we have been commanded to do, we must say we are unprofitable servants. We have done only that which it was our duty to do. It seems to me that in the new covenant we have been elevated above mere duty. We have been made laborers together with God. We have been made partakers of Jesus Christ partakers of the divine nature and have been given all things that pertain to life and to godliness they are adequate without a liturgy or is there a liturgy being expounded here as preeminent over this spiritual relationship with god can a person walk by faith before god and not worship or can he worship incorrectly as to the text, Matthew, the 15th chapter and verse 9, yes, uh, there are doctrines do have an effect upon worship. And I do want to draw to your attention that it is your doctrine that is on trial here tonight and my practice. And there's a dramatic difference between the two. Jesus did not say, in vain do you worship me, practicing what is unauthorized 
He said, in vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. This by no means justifies being disobedient. The emphasis is on profitability in the kingdom of God. Nowhere is a meticulous view of worship presented in Scripture. If it is, we need to have it. The entire proposition, the whole presentation of Brother Hires presumes that there is a liturgical approach to God, that God has spelled out precisely how we should come. We are calling upon him to justify that position, not because we're trying to divert the attention, but because if worship cannot be substantiated to be regulated by the word of God, the proposition, if I recall it correctly, says that the, uh, the use of mechanical instruments of music as an element of Christian worship is unauthorized by scripture, so we of course uh, do not even accept the testimony of other men no matter who it is we do not accept that the scriptures must tell us that there is a liturgy laid out for mankind the new covenant emphasizes uh, the objectives of god not the obligations of man <clears throat> the reason for that is quite simple that in christ jesus the eyes of our understanding are open we are freed from our sin and we serve him acceptably in reverence not in routine and in godly fear not in routine or liturgy as to the text in john the fourth chapter in verse 24 they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth the text teaches exactly the opposite of what we've been told the samaritan woman thought that it meant what brother hire said she said you say jerusalem's the place to worship our fathers say samaria is where where are we to worship Jesus, says woman? The hour is coming when these times and places aren't going to be the point. There's going to be a spiritual worship of God, a worship that proceeds out of a cognizance of him, an awareness of God, who he is and what he's done, and in comportment with truth, not just merely scriptural truth, but with an, uh, uh, an obtainment of the truth declared by scripture, a perception of the Christ who the scriptures declare. Spirit. And in truth, truth is the opposite of ignorantly worship, not worship in the wrong routine. Romans, the 14th chapter, expounds this approach to God by us and makes a positive affirmation about those that are accepted by God. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Meat and drink under the law was liturgy. It stood in carnal ordinances and meats and drinks and diverse washings. That's the kind of worship the Jews had. The Old Covenant had precisely that kind of worship. That's the kind of worship that's being propounded here tonight. The very worship that Jesus Christ took away because it was dead and addressed to dead people. He had, this is the type that is being expounded. The Word of God says the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he that in these things, in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, service Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Now I suggest to you there was a very good reason why the apostle did not launch into a dissertation on acceptable means of worship and how you could only offer to God what was authorized. Why did Jesus receive that alabaster box? Why did she, brother? Why did he, brother? Why did he let the woman wash his feet with her tears and dry him with her hair? Why did he? It was not authorized. Why did he receive it he that in these things righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit serves him is is accepted <clears throat> i'd like to have chart 26 please <clears throat> the unauthorized concept or the regulative principle or whatever term you wish to use which states that uh, only what is commanded or authorized by god is acceptable in worship <clears throat> If ever there was a time when there should have been numerous violations of that rule, it should have been in the early church. There was an ideal climate for the unauthorized concept. We had the church in its infancy marked by a remarkable degree of spiritual ignorance. They were fresh out of Judaism, millions of them cleaving, thousands of them cleaving to old Jewish traditions. There were false apostles rampant in the land that said they were from the apostles of christ but really were not there were judaistic teachers teaching that except one be circumcised after the manner of moses 
they could not be saved. They were many people pressed out of idolatry, cleaving to remarkably low levels of comprehension in the kingdom. And the scriptures were not, the apostolic writings in particular, were not compiled. An ideal climate for something unauthorized to occur, for somebody somewhere to do something wrong, for someone to worship God unacceptably at the wrong time, with the wrong thing, yet there is not a single revealed occurrence of an unauthorized act. There are no particular curses by the apostles upon those who did worship God wrong or who came to Christ wrong or who served him incorrectly. No explicit warnings about it. You see, a concept must be produced by truth to be valid. Blind Bartimaeus, thank God he didn't know about this rule that says you can't offer or come to him with without being authorized. He'd have never been healed of his blindness. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, unauthorized, but, but he came away because he did come in spirit and in, in truth, in comportment with reality. His request perfectly agreed with Christ's mission. How about the women that met Jesus when he was coming away from the tomb? They held him by the feet and worshipped him, the scripture says, completely unauthorized, yet the Lord Jesus did not turn them away. In the new covenant, it is the person that is authorized, not merely the deed. Even back under, uh, before the law of Moses, uh, God told us about his acceptance of persons. He said to Cain, he said, if you do well, you'll be accepted. You will be accepted. Lot, he was, an un he was a, a person coming out from Sodom, and he made an unauthorized request to go to a little city. And Genesis 19, 2 says he was accepted. He was accepted. That's the point in Christ Jesus. It's a diversionary tactic to turn away to what we do, whether it's accepted. It's whether we are accepted is the issue. Whether you've been received is the issue. God has received us in Christ Jesus. Oh, that men would see it more. Cornelius was a man who himself was accepted. And we, the scripture says, are accepted in the beloved. Now, for an accepted person to worship unacceptably seems to me to be an incongruous and illogical thought. Is it true, is it possible, Brother Hires, that a person can be received in Christ Jesus through his obedience to the gospel, that he can obey the gospel and come into Christ, and that he can worship wrongly? Is that true? We need to, we need to know if that is. We serve him acceptably out of our personal purity in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> there are things that are acceptable to God. His, uh, we serve him acceptably with reverence and with godly fear, an awareness that has been produced by the gospel of Christ, not by rules and regulations. <clears throat> that God would leave something essential to his acceptance to be determined by implication is unthinkable and you have set before us a rule tonight that must be determined by implication it is an attempt to restructure the old covenant uh, you must remember that where real jeopardy exists god consistently gives us warning god consistently warns if there's danger back under the law when people were approached to the mount of Sinai, God said, tell the people not to come near. Someone will break through and be slain. Fence it off. Keep them away. Every place consistently through history where there was jeopardy, God warned. He was not ambiguous about it. The salvation of men is at stake. Jesus Christ came to save the world, and he did not leave traps and snares that enabled a person to worship incorrectly and improperly. This is an attempt to mingle drawing nigh with restriction, and those are incongruous things. You cannot draw near to God and be restricted at the same time. I think perhaps some of the difficulty has been produced by a lack of awareness of what has been accomplished in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> there are things that have been authorized by the new covenant. They are not routine. God has been authorized, if you please, to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. Believers 
have been authorized to make their request known to God. Now, someone may say, well, but this is not germane to the subject. Oh, but it is germane to the subject. It is indeed. We're talking about things that are acceptable to God. And God speaks about acceptance and approval and reception of men quite differently than we have heard tonight. We are authorized to enter boldly into the presence of God, and no accompanying routine is specified. <clears throat> Actions are prohibited when they violate the reality that's in Christ Jesus. We would not think of offering a sacrifice to God because the Lamb of God has been revealed. We would not think of offering incense because a sweet-smelling savor has been offered to God that is superior. We do not refrain from it because God didn't tell us to do it. We refrain from it because we have received some better thing. As you may know, the uh, churches of Christ and Christian churches once were one. At that point, none of us used the instrument of music. It was later introduced. It caused division, and there has been division uh, throughout all the years since that time. We stand upon the original ground. We still not, do not use the instrument of music, and we believe for the same valid principles that the pioneers of the Restoration Movement rejected it when they said, let us speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. And I think it is obvious as we've come tonight uh, that Brother Blakely has no real presentation for his point of view. Uh, he has refused to deal with most of what I've said, even though I'm in the affirmative. I want to assure you that on uh, the third night of this debate, when he changes to the affirmative, I shall not follow the course that he's followed tonight. Whatever he presents, I hope that I'll be able to come back to the stand and follow it step by step and item by item and deal with the various matters that he's presented. But he's not elected to do that tonight. Uh, he has largely read, it appears, from prepared manuscripts made uh, months or weeks prior to this debate. Uh, he obviously came with no anticipation whatever of dealing with the matters that I present. Uh, he has allowed my first affirmative speech to go unanswered, and even though I endeavored to chastise him in a very kind way in my second address, in order to get him to deal with these matters, he has failed to do so. And so uh, it ought to be clear tonight that not only is he unable to answer the arguments presented, but that he is determined to go his way and to deliver his pre-prepared lectures, no matter what I may have to say on the subject. He's not going to deal with these matters, at least from the experience we've seen tonight, and I'll have no further speech tonight. We will be on the same proposition again uh, tomorrow night. But it is obvious that he does not intend to deal uh, with the matters that I presented. And of course, uh, it is up to the audience to evaluate uh, the matters that have been presented. Now, he said a little about Colossians 3 and verse 17. Uh, he said uh, he has over here on the chart Thayer's interpretation. No, that isn't true. We don't have here Thayer's interpretation. Thayer is a Greek lexicographer. That is the equivalent of New Testament Greek to what Webster's Dictionary is of the English tongue. This is Thayer's discussion of the meaning and the significance of the word that is used in the inspired text. We're not dealing here with Thayer's interpretation. We're dealing with Paul's terminology. And Thayer is simply an authority on the New Testament Greek and one of the foremost authorities of all time. And he has just passed that up with a wave of the hand and said that he would give you his interpretation, that the name signifies the character of God. He has not said a word about the passage that I gave in Acts 4 and verse 7 in which it was asked by what power or in what name do you do these things, showing that that is the signification of the phraseology. Further in Acts 2.38, it is said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. If that does not signify that it is done by the authority of Christ, then let Brother Blakely tell us what is involved. Not only there, but in numerous other passages in the New Testament. And then he says uh, there's no such thing as corporate worship. He said uh, he does not show us what is required in the assembly. Well, bear in mind, I'm not required to do that by my proposition. He thinks that I am, and I believe that I am amply able to do it. And we'll have further discussion on that. But we are simply contending that as an element of Christian worship, 
mechanical instruments of music are without divine authority. It doesn't make any difference whether it's in the assembly or not. Why, he is not helped in any particular at all by all of this smoke screen that he casts up here about corporate worship and the assembly. Let him show where that instrumental music was used in Christian worship outside of the assembly. Let him do that. Well, he's not helping himself, and he's not addressing the proposition. We're saying that whether it's in the assembly or out of the assembly, if it involves worship of New Testament Christians, it is without scriptural authority. And to get up here and argue that there is no reference to corporate worship or worship in the assembly is simply an evasion of the issue. The issue is whether or not there is authority for the use of mechanical instruments of music in a Christian worship or as an element of Christian worship. And by the way, I have here a very fine book, and it is called The Church in the Bible, published by College Press and authored by none other than Brother Don DeWell. And in his chapter in this book on the subject, The Worship of the Church, Brother DeWelt says, we will confine our remarks to those expressions of worship related to the assembly. <laughs> Acts which express the worship of New Testament Christians as they gathered on the first day of the week. And he lists five of them. Continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, continuing steadfastly in the breaking of bread, continuing steadfastly in prayer, continuing steadfastly in fellowship, and lo and behold in his discussion of acts by which worship is expressed in the assembly, continuing steadfastly in spiritual songs, and he gives Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16 as the authority for what he says in his book. Thank you, Brother DeWell. Would you talk to him? He won't answer me. Maybe you could take him aside tonight. I've already encouraged Brother Fred to work on him. Maybe Brother Dunning can talk to him about how the New Testament authorizes. He's utterly in conflict tonight with what those who are identified with him have said. And I have already said before you that the reason for it is because of the fact that they are endeavoring to define a defense for that which is indefensible. They have gone from pillar to post and from one position to another in an effort to defend instrumental music in the worship. They cannot find the passage. They cannot cite the scripture. They cannot give the example. They cannot show the authority. And as a result of that, they have wavered all over the territory in various positions in an effort to find some justification for their practice. And they finally have come to the anti-authority, anti-nomian, anti-law, anti-gospel position that says no authority is necessary. Amen. And then he referred to uh, Matthew 15 and verse 9. And he says, that does not say in vain do they worship me practicing the commandments of men. He says, that says, uh, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Well, Brother Blakely, suppose that you practice what you teach. What happens then? If a man teaches for doctrines the commandments of men and then practices it, would you tell us what occurs in that situation? And then he referred to John 4 and verse 24, and you notice he never did turn around and look at this chart. He referred to the verse, but he never did really make an effort to uh, deal with the matters that I had presented here. And I showed that even Brother Blakely himself, he didn't even deal with his own statement. And his own definition of worship, he has referred to it as individual acts of homage. 
You know, there's that language that in his first speech he talked about being unscriptural and ungodly. And when I came back and showed him how his dear father, Brother Fred O. Blakely, used every one of those unscriptural, ungodly phrases, he never said another word about it. And then I go over here and I show where that he himself talked about that. He didn't say any more about that either. He referred to that in my proposition, but when I referred to it, he did largely what he has done in all other instances. He just observed the Passover. He passed right over it. And then I have up here that we're to worship in spirit with the inward man and in truth that it must be directed by and according to the truth. And I love what he said there. He said, well, that's the very opposite of what that means. <laughs> you notice that I have that over there in quotation marks with the inward man and must be directed by and according to the truth. I just didn't put up there on the chart where I got it. But it's right out of the same book from which I read a few minutes ago where the brother DeWelt has told us in clear and unmistakable terms, he must worship in spirit, that is, with the inward man. His soul or inward man must be a participator in this matter. He must worship in truth, that is, the outward expression of worship must be directed by and according to the truth. And so that's the very opposite, you see, of what John 4, 24 really says. And Brother Harris didn't know that. And Brother Dwell didn't know that either. All this time we thought it meant that a person had to do according to what God teaches in his word until Brother Blakely came along and assured us that was not the case. Get me chart number 29. Then he said uh, here, too, there is no condemnation of an unauthorized act in the New Testament. Well, I want to insist again that even if that were true, it would not help him. Because if I have these many verses that I've presented tonight where that we're commanded and admonished to do that which is authorized to act in the name of Christ, to walk by faith, without faith it is impossible to please him. And I set out very emphatically in my first speech that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That there is no word, there can be no faith. If there is no faith, there can be no walking by faith. If there is no walking by faith, there can be no pleasing God. He has yet to utter one syllable about that. I presented all of this up here in order to show that we must obey and we must do that which is authorized. And so even if there were no example of condemnation, even if what he says were true, it would not help his cause. He hasn't dealt with the positive principles that are involved in this discussion. He didn't deal with 2 John 9. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now then, he referred to the uh, woman uh, in John 12 that anointed the feet of Jesus. He said that was an unauthorized act. Thus, one may offer unauthorized acts of worship today. And so by implication, the argument concedes that the use of instrumental music is unauthorized, and thus it surrenders all of the arguments that all of his brethren have made down through all of the ages past. They're gone. Goodbye, Brother Dunning. Goodbye, Brother Boswell. Goodbye, Brother O.E. Payne. Goodbye, Brother DeWell. All of those arguments are gone. Brother Blakely's conceded those for you. Goodbye, Brother Julian Hunt, who's in the audience tonight. All of these who defended it as scriptural are gone, gone, gone. Because he says that isn't the case. And by the way, why cite authority from the scriptures for the proposition that no scriptural authority is necessary? Isn't that a bit contradictory? Now, the real issue is this. Does Mary's act of devotion imply that she could have observed the Sabbath on Monday or perhaps only monthly, that she could have served as a priest, or that she could have had a pig offered as a sacrifice? There's the real issue. Does the fact that she was able to offer a spontaneous act of devotion unto the Lord for whom there was a command to love with all of our heart, soul, and mind, mean that she could have positively violated the express instructions of the Word of God with reference to her worship. Let Brother Blakely deal with the real issues in this case. And men and brethren, <clears throat> might I see that last chart number 29, please, that Brother Hires uh, had? Let me 
examine your uh, attention to point B. Why cite authority from the scriptures for the proposition? Uh, we're not uh, citing authority from the scriptures. We simply showed that Jesus did not respect the principle of, of authorization. Jesus did not respect the very principle you're preaching tonight. He let a woman anoint him without authority. As to whether that will lead people to unauthorized acts, that's something with which you must wrestle. The apostles did not see necessity to wrestle with that situation. Thank you. The real issue in that, uh, in that example is not whether if she observed Sabbath on Monday, whether that would be accepted. The point was that she did something that was unauthorized and it was not commanded and Jesus received it. it it's hard to deal with that, I know. <clears throat> As to these texts that uh, repeatedly our brother has referred to, are you saying that 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter in verse 6, uh, that uh, we are not to think of men above that which is written, surely you are not saying that this supports, that that's the point that the apostle was making. He was speaking about giving inordinate attention to men, which in your repeated reference to authority seems to be what you're doing. Uh, again, we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith does come by hearing, but, uh, but what type of hearing is given? Consistently, faith is connected with the proclamation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, not of a liturgy or a routine. Faith cannot be promoted by teaching commandments. That this is true is found in the law of Moses, the most precise uh, set of commandments the world has ever seen, and yet it was not of faith. It did not promote faith. In fact, it was contrary to faith, shutting men up to it. Faith comes by hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's him of whom they hear that promotes faith, not a system of liturgy or routine. As we approach unto our living God, we approach through Christ Jesus, not through routine. Now, while that may seem trite to say that, that there may be some eloquent statements made in derogation of that, the apostolic presentation continues to be that. We approach the God through Christ Jesus, not through liturgy, and we are proclaimed to be accepted in the Beloved through Him. We would say to go and to learn what that meaneth. This great corporate approach, and I borrow that term, found in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. I want to go back to that because it is a hallmark text of approach unto God and acceptance before God, and it's contrasted with liturgy. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness, not temerity. Having boldness, not a list of routine. Having boldness, not merely authorization. To enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, not by a liturgy. By the blood of Jesus, not by a commandment. By a blood of Jesus, not by a routine. By a new and a living way, I suggest to you that the regulated worship cannot be a living way. That is a dead way. That's my, been my repeated point all through these beginning sessions, is that the postulate that has been presented to us tonight is that the living way, the New Testament way, New Testament worship uh, is accomplished through a routine or a liturgy or offering to God only what has been authorized, which presumes alienation, not reconciliation. It's only an alien that would tend to stray not those that have been reconciled to the, to the living God. Uh, Jesus Christ has consecrated this veil not through a list of commandments, but through his veil, that is to say, his, his flesh. He is a high priest over the house of God, which authorizes us to come. Again, this appears, I know, as though it's not relevant or germane to the subject, but my point is that this is what the apostle said was germane in approaching unto God. That when we come to him, this is what they thought about. They did not think about these things we have had presented to us tonight. They did not pose the danger, the imminent danger, of approaching unto God in an unspecified way or an unauthorized authorized way or an uncommanded way. These are the traditions of men, not of the apostles. Let's draw near with a true heart 
A heart that's been purified by faith, not by routine. A heart that's been purified by a conviction of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, not by the being convinced of a specified routine. Let's draw near with that kind of heart in full assurance that we're, we're accepted in the beloved. Our hearts have been sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies have been washed with pure water, can't you see the contrast, people? Between that and a liturgy, between that and a routine, between that and only offering what's been specified to God. God has brought us up into the heavenly places, and here in the heavenly places we are accepted in the beloved. Quite a dramatic difference from hunting for the right routine and right liturgy. Now let's hold fast the profession of our faith, not the routine. Let's hold fast the profession, the confession, if you please, of our faith, not hold fast the liturgy and specifics. Let's not just make sure we do all the right things at the right time. Let's make sure that we hold fast our profession of faith the foundation of which is that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, not that the routine has been specified unto us. Let's provoke one another to love and to good works, not by itemizing the routine, not by being a safeguard, uh, guarding every disciple and every follower of Christ to make sure they've done the right thing. I present to you, and we will continue through this debate to present to you, that those that have obeyed the gospel and come into Christ have done the right thing, and that they're accepted by God, and are nowhere picture as being rejected by God, that this text in Matthew 15, 9 was not addressed to the church, it was addressed to a group of decadent Pharisees that have supplanted the word of God with their tradition, that uh, have sought to have the authorized principle, just as some do today. That's who it was spoken to, not to the church. No apostle ever arraigned anyone for worshiping wrongly. In fact, they spoke of men that worship rather shrewdly, as we'll find uh, in the scripture throughout the remainder of this debate. Uh, we that sin willfully do so not by violating our routine, but by trampling underfoot the blood of the everlasting Son of God. I rejoice tonight that in Christ Jesus we are accepted, that even though we do all that we're commanded to do, that there is a dimension of discipleship that involves the heart and the spirit and brings a person into willing conformity with the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, not just memorizing a routine and a liturgy. I exhort you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed handling aright God's work, that God's word does not major on liturgy, that the apostles did not major on routine, that there is no place where they instructed us on worship. No place. If it is, we need to have that. Why? Because that's the basis of this whole debate. Because if there is no regulation for worship, the proposition falls to the ground. If worship can't be regulated, there's no point. There's no point to this proposition whatsoever. That's, that's, my, that's my point. I'll leave you with those words.